Uh, they're just all going to be wrong. <laughs> That's the thing. You don't. It's like terror. It's like the thing about art is that you give up on. Like you could always tweak it, but you give up. Hello and welcome to Radio Primavera Sound. It's kind of day two of the festival. Uh, it's kind of day three, depending on how you look at it. It could be day five if you look at it. <laughs> and we're not going out live anyway, so I don't know why I'm telling you this. But um, we have an amazing guest, Julia Holter. How on earth are you? I'm great, thank you. <laughs> Bringing some Los Angeles to, uh, to our humble studio. Yes. And not for the for the first time because um, well welcome back to Primavera Sound Barcelona. I remember seeing you twice here. Once it was at the auditory where you're playing today at uh, 7:30, and also one at the, uh, the like the amphitheater stage. Both of them were amazing. I don't know if you have any particular memories of that shows, and I I don't know if ha I have missed some other because you've you've kind of a regular of our, our festival yeah um i've played i think i've played maybe three times actually i really like playing at primavera we played at uh yeah we played at the outdoor stage once that that that, that was, was amazing oh thank you that was so for yeah it was super vibey cool yeah fun show it was really late and like I like that. Um, then we've played at the auditory every other time. So, and, and that's nice too. It's very like, it's it's a nice, it's not as much like a festival. It's more like a a really nice room, nice sounding room. And it's fun to play, to bring out all the sounds. And Do you like though the, the, the atmosphere of the, the festival vibe, this outdoorish and playing light and what do you think that this adds to to your to your music um yeah i like i like to play at, i like to play lots of different types of venue venues spaces and um i play such a range like i play small little rooms and different types of music even not always I, I, but I really like, um, I really like to play uh, shows like this because it's, I think that it's like a good, festivals can be nice because you're not like overthinking things. You kind of want to just like put something together that's in a way kind of concise and efficient and I <laughs> in a weird way that's kind of cool at least for me as a person who likes to make like six minute long songs that <laughs> ramble on like I think it's kind of fun to try making things not ramble but it's still like f yeah I don't know I just I like the um I like playing outside also and I Uh, although we're not playing, we usually don't play outside at Primavera, I guess. But but um, but I guess just in general, sometimes playing outside is kind of nice. And um, but 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 yeah, I like. It's just it's always just a very uh, nice festival to play at, and there's always a great audience, and it's just well curated. And yeah, <laughs> two two of your most recent um, records have been collaborations. Um, very different ones, one with um, a string quartet and one with Cool Super, kind of DJ electronic music um, producer. Um, what, do, what do you look for in a collaboration? Um, I don't know. I guess I just like to always do new things, try new things. So um, I, I mean, it's a great question. I think, I don't know. I just, I do things if it's it feels like it would be fun and if it would be something fresh and I could try things that I wouldn't have thought of. I think that that's the fun of working with other people is that they come up with ideas that you don't have, obviously, and then it makes you do new things. And I'm all about like rerouting my neural pathways <laughs> and trying new stuff. 
you you've mentioned uh, on the on the question before that uh, playing um, at outside venues uh, then keeps you from overthinking. Now you were saying again this idea mm -hmm. of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. Are you and and listening to your music? I'm I'm thinking that you are one of these musicians who thinks a lot of it. But but also for what you're saying. Mm, is it possible that you want to move a little bit from this tendency of you and then trying to do things more just for fun and not overthinking them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, I, I think I've always, um, at least with music, I think probably in my life in general, it's a, it's a struggle sometimes to do basic things because I. I'm always like overly hesitant about everything. But one thing that I that I think is good for me about music is that I tend to be like, at least when I'm making something, I can't really make anything unless I'm just like relaxed enough to let something emerge. And I don't overthink that part of the process. But then of course, um, then there's always the editing and that is a huge part of music making. So you're not just like coming up with like brilliant ideas all the time, <laughs> you know, it's like, like often you're um, such a small part of it is the stuff that comes freely. Uh, those are like these moments of like magic that kind of just emerge magically or whatever. Then there's like the part where of like gluing things together and editing it and kind of thinking or forming it really. And for me, there's there's definitely a potential for overthinking that process, that part of the process, of the creative process. And I think that is something I, I try to be really sensitive about in um, over the years. I've had different ways of, and I change my mind all the time about, oh, I overthink this. Oh, I didn't overthink this. And blah, blah, blah. like, and it's, and so, yeah, I'm always like, I think, I'm always trying to strike a balance because I do really like to make things um, sound as good as they possibly can. But I also, I also am probably, if you know my music, you know I don't actually worry too much about it. <laughs> I sometimes things sound pretty specific. I mean, uh, kind of wild or whatever. I'm interested, how does um, your role as a professor of the practice in songwriting <laughs> fit into that? Because, I mean, I, I was reading, you, you once said um, there's sort of an academic label uh, put on me that seems inaccurate. Yeah. And um, <laughs> a visiting assistant professor is uh, kind of an academic role. I was just wondering, is that sort of different parts of your brain? Well, I've only taught the class once, but I'm hoping to do it again. Um, they'll have me back. Um, <laughs> No, no, but um, I really like teaching, actually. I think I'm, like, learning, you know, how to do it because it's, you know, some people have done it for years and they're so experienced and it really does take experience. Um, I don't necessarily think of it as being academic in that sense of... Um, first of all, I love academics and I... <laughs> I, I guess um, I was raised by academics and I like them. Uh, my partner Tashi just did a residency at this place in Berlin where it was a bunch of academics and I think I guess I just always have felt a little too scatterbrained <laughs> and so I don't feel like I fit in so well. Um, but I think in music, you know, I think there's always going to be something a little bit I, I'm sure people would say this in other fields as well, but in my opinion music is exceptionally like complicated with like um the academic world because or maybe the creative process of um, writing is confusing with the academic world but it's like a very interesting confusion to me like I think so I guess what I was saying back then when I would say that is that there was this yeah there was always people saying like you set like your music to Greek tragedies and, and and like it was kind of funny because it was so embarrassing because like I only read that one like I just read Hippolytus because I was interested but I really didn't have some background in, in anything uh, I never studied like ancient texts or I, I mean I, I I just felt like I really what I was trying to say is like I'm not actually 
very academic. I just <laughs> happened to like the story. And um, so that, so I just didn't want there to be kind of a idea that I was like trying to be something I'm not. But, but I find that kind of very interesting because um, in terms of songwriting, I, I remember reading once someone saying that if you write a song and it has a, you know, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus, then that is a successful song. <laughs> but like, and, and no one can say that isn't a good song because it's like it has everything a song needs. Right. But like it might not move you or there might be a sort of, I don't know, like a really basic Ramones song or, or yeah. something like that. And you might really, really like it. Do you, I mean, how, does, how do you deal with that as a sort of professor of it? I don't know. That's something, you know, like I said, I taught the course once and I think that I could have been a little more structured because I, uh, I, I think like I, st I studied, um, so in school I never studied songwriting. I studied, um, like composition. So I was, it was very open. Like I would choose the forms I wanted to use. And so I've never understood using a form for songwriting because to me it's free form you do what you want. And, um, but that doesn't mean I don't have verses and choruses in my songs. A lot of them do. Most of them probably do. And, and bridges. Um, I just come to it however I want to. And I think, um, so I'm interested in what, who said the thing about if it has a verse and chorus, it's a good song because it's not that I, yeah, I wonder what that means. Like maybe what they're trying to say is anyone can do it, which I like that kind of, kind of uh, approach um, but I also don't know why does it but why does it have to be a verse and a, like I would say like just have if there's a vocal um, if there's a melody that's probably what a song is is, a, is a, there's a melody I would say that's what all a song is really that, 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 that. <laughs> like to me I don't know about good I mean also what does good mean who knows because uh, but sure I'd be happy to say if there's a melody it's a good song but I think I struggle with trying to teach someone about like having to have a verse and a chorus and a bridge. I think that that feels so specific to me. And in, and in a way, it would be the same as being in composition and someone saying in my composition lesson and my teacher saying you have to have uh, like a, an expo ex ex exposition or whatever it's called. Like the, the whole like symphony form and like a development section and a recapitulation section. And uh, because like, I mean, you don't have to, because why would you? And composers never writ, wrote that way. Like songwriters never wrote some, I'm actually, I might probably wrong, but at least maybe pop strategizing, you do think about that. But I mean, um, I would say probably a lot of composers never in the back of the day thought a whole lot about, well, this is my recapitulation. Not a whole lot, you know, it kind of came natural, I'm guessing. That the, all that analyzing of the first course verse, the, the recapitulation, exposition, and development section, all that stuff, sonata form. I mean, it, it all came after the people did it, right? So then you don't want to <laughs> force. But it is important to like teach, especially when I was like 19, I wanted structure. So I understand. I think young people do want structure. And so it is good to start with that. I think that's a really reasonable thing to start with something structured and then they can like build off of that. So I just have to learn how to like mm -hmm. do that because it wasn't really the way I went about songwriting. Well, um, you have mentioned um, this idea of pop having a, 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 strategy, a strategy and, and also this uh, that maybe when you started your career, a uh, structure would be something that could be useful. But... Uh, at least, and when the, the first albums of yours I, I, I listened to, uh, Tragedy and Ecstasy, uh, by the way, uh, Greek words as, yeah, as, a, as academia, which is another uh, Greek, know, Greek word, <laughs> they, you're particularly, uh, you felt like really um, not bothered by structures, mm -hmm. like I think that you have <laughs> always used structure in a very freely form and, and that it's something that, that of course, it's one of the things that makes us love your music. Nice, nice. Thank you. Yeah, I like to, I do it based on the sound, really. Like, I feel like there are clear forms to the songs, but I'm not 
it's sonic it's lead like oh i want this i need some space here like okay i want that to come back now <laughs> you know it's like kind of in, in, in intuitive i guess or something i it, when I introduced you, I said you uh, you were bringing some Los Angeles to our studio. Um, and it's interesting because I used to think that your music um, was very Los Angeles, partic uh, particularly Have You In My Wilderness. Uh, yeah. And then I went to Los Angeles <laughs> and uh, it, it, was, it wasn't quite like that. It wasn't quite quite what I was, what I was, what I was expecting. I had, had a very good time, nothing against it. But like, where, do you, where do you think your music belongs do you think there's a space that it belongs in and 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 also what you're saying is that you're like your idea of los angeles that you imagine right. because of julia's songs but then <laughs> so funny <laughs> totally oh wait what, what that question was uh where do you think i mean do, do you think your music is very los angeles for a start or where where does it belong or reflect oh gosh i don't know where my well i don't know i don't know where my music belongs but I guess the thing about Los Angeles I'd be curious like what your experience is because it's really um complicated city it's not like um definable and I think that's what people well it it, it isn't easily definable it's not easily you can't ca I mean you can sort of try to capture it in an image but it would be one aspect of it Um, I think that that's true of a lot of places, but I would say with LA, it's particularly particularly true because there are so many different uh, facets of it, and so many different communities, and so many different um, it uh, images that 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 represent it, and. Um, The obvious one is always Hollywood, but it's not. I mean, I don't really have a much of a connection to Hollywood. I've scored a few films in the most in very recent years, a few, but not. But I'm not like other than that. That's like, I mean, I don't. I mean, like, pe like also the directors didn't live in Los Angeles, and I I don't know if that matters. But anyway, <laughs> I just think I mean I don't know like people in Hollywood or like I'm I I think that most of LA is not Hollywood so so just it's hard I mean that's like sort of an obvious one but and probably a lot of people realize that most of LA is in Hollywood but yeah it's just very hard to pin down and so possibly my music <laughs> is is like that actually probably I would I don't know if that's true of my music to me it's like that but I also think there's this thing musicians always do where they're like oh my god I made this new record it sounds like totally different than anything I've ever made <laughs> and then you listen you're like no that sounds like your music because <laughs> it's hard to see that as your as oneself uh, you always think you're doing something like crazy and then it's like no it sounds like you this is this is something that I think that uh, journalists we we experiment a yeah. lot because it So there's lots of time that musicians are they are adamant in the idea yeah. that this is the record is like very different and yeah. it's like well <laughs> it's right it's so funny there's a fascinating series or there used to be the vice i think it was vice used to do which was called rate your records which i really liked because basically they asked musicians like <laughs> rate, rate, you know, actually, literally That's go so through their mean. back. Cut. I know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to ask, but it's no, really it's fascinating funny. to see, you know, musicians actually being like, "Oh, yeah, that record wasn't so good for kind of X, re X reasons, and that record was really good." And it was kind of fascinating because, yeah. you know, sometimes it would be you totally agree with them, and sometimes you'd be like, oh, oh, they're just all going to be wrong. <laughs> That's the thing. You don't. It's like terror. It's like the thing about art is that you'd give up on. Like you could always tweak it, but you give up. <laughs> and it's never perfect and you just that's why it's so that's such a like a masochistic <laughs> thing to do or not just sadistic actually to make <laughs> artists do that but it's funny also <laughs> and then you probably just get the perspective that they're all wrong right because they're all like they'll be like ah no I should have done this and be like no I love that I mean I feel that way all the time about my music We, we are not going to ask you this sadistic yeah, question, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but um, I've, I've noticed that, that it's been 10 years since Loud City Song. And um, well, do you think that I, I can, I, I think that people was talking about you before, but we can say that was a bit of a, um, 
uh, breakthrough album. I don't know if you remember that way. And mm -hmm. and how are how are you? How how is this the the musician that you are today? Same or different than that that Julia Holter? Oh um, yeah, I definitely for me that was I mean, ten, basically ten years ago was when I started touring ever and like um, it, it was probably um, 11 years ago that I started touring for the first time and mostly 10 though and so that was a huge turning point in my life because I wasn't doing anything else I was just doing music and so for me that was very significant um, and and I think it changed my life a lot Um, I'm really happy just doing music and I hope I can keep it just doing music. Um, I feel very much the same person. I mean, I don't know. I, f I definitely feel like the same. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> you, you mentioned soundtracks. You recently composed a soundtrack to The Passion of Joan of Arc, which is a classic, classic film. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what appealed to you about the film? Well, um, I, it was a little bit of an assignment um, in 2017. There's a, um, an organization in L.A. Um, that basically um, uh, commissioned um, a performance, a live scoring of, of and that I was choosing between two films and one was The Passion of Joan of Arc which I'd have never I had never seen actually and then another film so I I was like definitely Joan of Arc the other film was great too but I didn't really watch it but I was just like definitely Joan of Arc because I'm really into medieval stuff <laughs> and it's just like I'd never seen it but I'd always seen the imagery and I was like this film is incredible and so that's sort of what it had it had started it um and um I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, but anyway, I've credited them when I've, but they were a really cool, or um, that was a really cool commission. And, um, oh, oh, Unsilent Cinema. Yeah. I don't know if they're still doing things, but anyway, they did that. And it was a really fun opportunity to get, um, to perform it live with musicians I play with a lot. Um, and, That's how it started. So um, someone um, at Opera North is an organization in Leeds, UK, that does all kinds of projects. And they were doing things with like artists, like um, composers, song, or yeah, maybe songwriters, composers um, that are kind of d different than what the usual um, opera chorus stuff um, um, were like repertoire. And so they, they like commissioned this. Joan of Arc thing for the chorus and so that was um, how that came about so I mean in a way I didn't choose the film but uh, I'm very I kind of did and I'm like obsessed with the film it's just <laughs> totally incredible it's so um, like classic it just will always be shocking and striking and crazy and disturbing and beautiful and And it's so it's really nice to work with something because you see it all, over and over when you're working on we're rehearsing and stuff. And I never get sick of it because it's and I don't know if Dreyer would have wanted me to be doing this, <laughs> the, the director. So it's a little like, oops, well, oh, well, I want to do it. And it seems like some other people do. So you, de you defined it as 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 classic. But but of course, Dreyer was so avant garde as well, mm -hmm. which is something that we can apply to, to your music. I mean, there's a classic essence in it, but there's also a vision to move forward. Do, mm. you, do you agree with this? Um, I don't know. I think that's hard for me to tell. You know, like, I think that I've always had trouble um, feeling like I know, and this is probably true of so many artists, like feeling like I, where, I, where I fit in. Um, like I 
never fit in as a composer to me in school. I always felt like I was too of a dilettante. Like, I want to do this. I want to do this. And they were like, there were people there just had studied like classical symphonies for years and like were writing these incredible symphonies. And I wasn't that focused on like a particular tradition. And I've never been able to work within traditions. And I think some people are really good at that and some people really are not. And that's not for me. Like, I'm not good at that. And it's better for me to just like try things out and be inspired by certain traditions, but not necessarily successfully crafting something within um, the frameworks that those tradition. So, so for me, um, I I really I really love melody. I love working with melody. I love playing with sounds and and I love being really playful in my music and whatever that yields it's like I don't know I think that I do like um, have trouble with any kind of like um, thinking too much about things or having too much of a clear structure um, too much of a system anything like that Um, so that probably means it's not very traditional um, but, but I don't know. I'm really interested in what your show today is going to be like because, as I mentioned, you've got your two most recent things were collaborations. There was a soundtrack to um, the Passion of, of Joan of Arc. Um, your uh, last kind of solo studio album that wasn't a soundtrack was 2018. So, like, what is it? Yeah, what's it going to be like today? Like, I mean, I could imagine you doing a thousand different shows, but which one? <laughs> I know. Which one do we get? I know it's been. I know it's. I mean, it's definitely the pandemic. Uh, kind of has made everything. Um, I've never waited so long to like release things, but um, but it's been a really busy few years, and um, we're we're gonna do some things, some new things, and you know, we'll hear stuff. We'll hear some new and old. <laughs> we've got um, I we've got um, Beth Goodfellow on percussion and Devin Hoff on bass, electric bass, no upright. So that's a new thing. He's playing fretless, which is like, oh, love. I've been loving. I've been working with him a lot on fretless bass recently. So we're excited to do show that. And then Tashi Wada, uh, my partner, we play with uh, who I play with a lot on um, synth and um, bagpipe. So bagpipes. It's be fun. Oh my god! <laughs> you, 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 ha- you have that in uh, his sweet spot ah, because he's a Scottish. Yay! Well, well, I'm, I'm not a fan of bagpipes, so I'm sure I'm sure you do very well. But in <laughs> he, general, bagpipes. He's so. not doing I'm, like I'm, a traditional sorry. Scottish okay, melodies. Good, if good. you have a, a problem with those. Uh, it, it, <laughs> sorry, I, Ben. I, I did remember that you had something with bagpipes, but I, 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 I do like remember it wrong. Sorry. <laughs> it's hearing people practicing bagpipes that really, really, really got me. That's not a, not a good I thing. I understand. It's like, yeah. I love bagpipes, but I also <laughs> am not from Scotland. So I'm from LA, and I would walk through like Elysian Park and Echo Park way back in the day, and there would be a guy always practicing bagpipe. And I was like, oh, it sounds so good. It sounds so good. It's the best sound. And then, like, I'm so lucky that my husband plays bagpipe because <laughs> there's one, I love it so much. <clears throat> there's one ever jazz bagpipe player. I can't remember his name, but like there's some some. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I think it was I think there. we've listened to it. I don't remember what it sounded like. We should listen again. Sounds pretty good. Surprisingly good. Uh, Surpri- cool. A lot better than thirteen year olds uh, practicing. But look. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's going to be uh, it's going to be an incredible concert tonight. Thanks for coming along. Thanks for playing and um, and hoping that this new material that that we're going to listen to today it soon ends mm-hmm. up also um, on our on an album that we can listen to. Yes. And if it is very bagpipe based, just forget what I said. <laughs> just be, be, be confident. It'll be it'll be good. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. RPS Live from Premier Beta Sound. Proudly presented by Meta Hype and Cooper.